presentation. In 2004, Kevin and his cousin Don Emery purchased names of performance from Steve and Joan Ames. Since then, the business has moved into a new state-of-the-art facility in its hometown. Operating systems have been updated, and the product line has expanded considerably with the addition of two more Pontiac line catalogs. Kevin will discuss a brief history of Ames Performance Engineering, followed by a discussion about the past, present, and future of the Pontiac restoration parts industry, manufacturing processes, quality control, future projects, etc. Now, personal note, I have a 1968 GTO, which was in pretty rough shape when I bought it, and I've gotten all my parts since 2003 from Ames Performance. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you and welcome. Uh, so I guess I'll start out, uh, I can do, do my own background as far as uh, my involvement now. I became a uh, fellow Pontiac GTO enthusiast and uh, became a passion of mine. So this, this car right here pretty much started it all for me. Um, my dad bought this car right in 67. Uh, you'll see my brother is in the back seat, and I was one year old at the time, so I'm probably back there too, you just can't see me. Um, he had this car, uh, sold it in 1973, um, and after he sold it, you know, as I got older, I started to gain interest in, in cars and stuff, and uh, I heard all the stories about the car, and my mom at the red light racing whoever, and, that would get back to my dad, and it was just, it's, uh, you know, my dad doing burnouts with it. And so it was, uh, it was really, uh, and I just uh, love the car, the color, the looks, 67 is just, a, and, and the, the fact that that was, uh, you know, my parents bought it brand new in 67. So we sold it in 73. That was the story goes along. 1982, um, a friend of mine in high school was going to look at a 67 Le Mans. And um, he wanted my dad to go look at it with him. We didn't know anything much about cars. We were just a couple of young kids. So uh, my dad went to look at it with him. And out behind the house, there was this car covered up by a tarp on, up on blocks. And my dad said, what's that? He said, the guy said, 67 GTO. And this was, I think this was 1982. So it's been about nine, well, almost nine, ten years since he sold it. And uh, he said, really? And he went over there and looked at it. Sure enough, flipped the cover. It was all faded, the paint, everything. 67 GTO, the light blue, white top. And he says, wow, that looks just like my car. Well, back when my parents had it brand new, um, my mom went to throw something out of the window, and I still give her a hard time about that now, because she was literate. It was probably a beer bottle at the time. Caught the edge of the glass, it broke the uh, passenger side window. So he, he immediately went to the passenger side, opened up the door, shook it, broken door glass in there. Checked the rear quarter, um, he slid it into a post. He, of course, back then they were driving, it was a daily driver, so during the winter, they drove it. Slid it into a post, had the rear quarter fixed, sure enough, that damage was there. Um, and he towed a boat with it, the wiring and everything was there, so it was his original car. Um, so we were just ecstatic, I was ecstatic, because this was the car I always heard all the stories about, and it was just the, if we only still had it, you know, and. Uh, so we ended up working a deal with the guy. I had a 67 Cougar. Don't hold that against me. And I said, well, what if I trade? Would you take a trade and some cash? So I worked out a deal. I think we got it for $700. Figured the Cougar was worth about $600. And mind you, at this time, that was a nice running car. Back then, that was what you could pick these cars up for. And then another 300 I think it was another, maybe another $300 to to seal the deal. So we left with the, uh, the 67 GTO. And my friend didn't buy the 67 Le Mans because there were some issues with it. So, um, But anyway, so that, that's really the car that started it all for me. Um, and we got it back home. I drove it for two years in high school. Then uh, I went out for the service and uh, did four years in service. Came back and then uh, drove it for a little while. And eventually did a frame off restoration. And we still have the car to this day. Um, it's, it's really just a beautiful car and uh, kept it all original hubcaps and everything and um, you know it's just uh, that's you know, like I said that's the one that really got me into it so during that whole time when I had the car in high school um, it's funny because this is where I come into uh, knowing Steve Steve and Joan Ames performance 
Uh, he would come over and I had this car as well as a uh, 66 GTO and a six, I had a convertible and a hard top. And at the time, Steve had no cars. He had no Pontiacs, he had a beat up old pickup truck and that was when the business was, they were just getting going with it. So uh, he knew that I had, um, had the GTOs and uh, he called me up one day and said, hey, do you mind if I come over and test fit some parts on your car? And I'll give you some free product. So he came over and uh, with his old beat up truck and uh, was checking out, uh, at that time he was making pedal pads, the reproduction pedal pads, and that was actually one of the first reproductions. He was making pedal pads and he came over and test fitted them on the cars and sure enough he gave me product and, and he went on his way and uh, that's uh, a year or so later I went off to the service. I got back from the service and uh, I was a diesel mechanic in for a Penske truck leasing. And, uh, the business at that time, Steve, when he came over and uh, was testing car when I was in high school, I think they may have had four employees, and two of them were part times. And um, when he called me, when I got back from the service, he called me and said, hey, the business is growing, and uh, we need a good, uh, you know, someone that knows the cars, and uh, a good salesperson slash pet, would you be interested? And, you know, I immediately was thinking, oh yeah, I'd love to do something that a passion of mine. But then I was also thinking I was going to take a hidden pay, and I was thinking of the advancements that I could make through Penske Truck Leasing, where probably there was more possibility there for growth than at Ames Performance. At the time, I think we had nine employees at Ames. But then I just got to thinking about it, and I said, what better thing to do is, uh, you know, a um, work, you know, a passion, have it as a passion, but also do that as a business, you know, as work. I mean, and I was, so I went, I said, yeah, sure, Steve. I'll come back. And before I accepted, he brought me over, and at this time he had some cars, and he took me to do a car collection. Of course, anyone who goes to the car collection, Steve's car collection was always like a maze, you know, the stuff he has. And so that really kind of won me over at the same time. So um, I accepted the job, and then, uh, it just, uh, Steve and I hit it quite, we hit it off, Steve, uh, Joan, and I. Um, you know, they were like uh, my second parents, and uh, we got along great on the road, and uh, just uh, with everything, I had a great relationship with them. And through the years, you know, the business kept growing, kept growing, kept growing. And uh, Steve and Joan, uh, their, their business philosophy is they like to keep it kind of a tight-knit, kind of a family, a small group, and it was getting big. It was getting too big for their comfort, and they figured it was probably time to, uh, probably time to uh, sell the retail end of the business. Uh, they had both the retail and the wholesale, which they kept the wholesale and they sold the retail. Um, at that time, that was um, oh, 2004, and that's when uh, I knew that uh, Steve was interested in uh, you know passing that on, and I say passing on, selling it. Uh, we looked at ESOPs, doing an uh, employee stock option purchase. That was too complicated. So then I put together a uh, plan with uh, my business partner now, slash cousin, Don Emery. Uh, we came up with a plan, we presented it, met with Steve and Joan, and um, we sold houses, we sold everything we had to come up with uh, what we needed for a deposit on the business. And uh, we put it together, and um, that's, uh, yeah, that was back in 2004. And, um, it's just been a, a, a great ride since. I mean, we took the business and we actually grew it by uh, uh, non Seed uh, had restricted phone lines to keep the business at a certain size. We opened up all the phone lines. We put in a new operating system. Uh, we worked out in the old building for probably, um, oh, I think it was probably two years, and then we built our own facility, which uh, I'll show you a picture of the old building, which is, um, you'll see why, uh, why we moved out of it. Um, that's the old building. And you'll see there's multiple levels. Uh, there's two other buildings behind it, all connected by catwalks. So as you can imagine, for efficiency reasons, this was totally inefficient. And at the time when Steve and Joan built this, it was such a small business that you didn't really have to think of the covering all the floors going between multiple buildings and uh, these guys were putting, uh, I, uh, they had those, um, one time we took, what do they call that? Uh, oh, you can tell how many steps you take. Well, nowadays it's called a pit bit. There you go. They put one of those on uh, one of our major pickers, 
And uh, it was crazy how many miles he walked in one day to pick all those orders. So we ended up, uh, again, we moved, uh, moved out of here. It was about two years we were in this building, leased it from Steve. Then we moved out of there and uh, built our own facility, which is all one level. Um, oh, another good story about this building. You see actually this picture right here. So my first day in English performance. I come bombing in, it was just like this, snow, and actually perfect conditions here. I come bombing in my car, I lock my brakes up, I miss the turn there, I come sliding across the front of the building, and mind you, there's windows there, people are looking out, oh yeah, here comes the new guy. Bam, right in that snowman. Fairy in my mind, I'm right in the snowman. So here I come, yeah, this is the new guy. Hey, can anyone pull me out? <laughs> I was, yeah, it was just a, a fun, funny as heck, because I just see him looking, yep, yep, there he goes, see ya. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so let me show you a picture of the, uh, the new facility here. <coughs> this is it here. Um, you see it's all one level. Uh, we have loading dock. Uh, Two low dock doors, a, uh, a dock leveler, so the tractor trailer trucks could move in, uh, can back right in, easy, uh, easy in, easy unload. Um, that building's 20, 23,000 square feet and 3,000 upstairs. Uh, we put, uh, we can actually run pallets up there through the, uh, through the. Um, uh, there's a dock house inside, so we just run the forklift right up. Uh, we put our slower moving inventory up top. But you can see it's just a, a lot more efficient facility than what we uh, what we were used to. And again, in Stephen Jones' defense, it's, um, they did not expect the business to grow like it had. When they started the business, they were um, uh, Steve was a uh, engineer and Joan was uh, a school teacher, and they actually figured that they were going to have to. Uh, they figured they'd ride the wave out until it hit land. And then they were going to have to go back to engineering and being a school teacher. But the business just kept growing and growing and growing. It's, uh, they had no idea that the industry was going to was going to last this long and be as big as it is. This is the inside of the uh, the warehouse. Oh, let's see here. That's uh, part of the office. So the office in the other building was about 1,500 square feet. This office is 4,000 square feet. This is a current shot of our tech center where we have all our, our books, our resource materials, and all that. All the GM parts books, the dealer albums. Um, we also have uh, we have several cars that we use for R&D. There's some pictures of the guys doing some R&D work. Sorry about the, uh, the slideshow here. It's not really too good of a slideshow, but that's Shannon. So the business now, we have, um, we have 20, 28 employees right now. And uh, the business uh, doubled in size since, uh, since myself and Don bought it. Um, and at the time when we bought the business, we had 22 uh, employees. So you can imagine the efficiencies uh, by doubling the size, but yet not your manpower. There were so many efficiencies gained by going into this new facility and also through the system, uh, the operating system that we put in place. Oh, this is uh, yeah, another office shot. So this is our office cap. Uh, one thing, uh, like I said, the, fam uh, the, the business was always focused around families and just having that family feel to it. And it still is. Um, we have a cat running around, we have dogs in there. Um, you know, sometimes there'll be kids in the break room. It's just a, it's a nice uh, homey feel. Uh, we're not a corporation, we're not, uh, we don't want to be. You know, it's just, uh, it's, it's pretty much stayed the way the, the company was when Stephen Jones first started it with that same feel. Um, so this is our office cap. See that the Trans Am in the background? That's where the cat sleeps, inside the Trans Am. 
provide. So the first time we went in there, that, that's the first, uh, that car right there is the first Trans Am ever built. So whenever I went in there and I saw the cab inside, I'm like, oh no, the cat's in the car. But the car has not been restored yet, so I'm just, I turned a blind eye to it. And, um, I mean, how can I get upset at that? Uh, we do have a loop, not in the car though. Oh, okay. So, um, this is uh, actually, this is the crew now. That's one of our catalog pictures. So I'm gonna go back to, um, back to Ains' performance and uh, how it started. Uh, basically, uh, Stephen Jones started the business in 1976. Uh, he was buying NOS parts, new old stock parts from the dealerships. I'm sure you guys all know what the NOS part is. So, and it was uh, Chevrolet parts. And every now and then he would get um, he would get a load, and there'd be some Pontiac parts in there. And the avenue for him to sell these parts was uh, through the uh, swap meets. So he'd lay all these parts out. And all of a sudden, someone would come right in and buy up all these Pontiac parts that'd be gone. And then there's all the Chevy stuff still sitting there. So that, that triggered, hey, he needs to go into the, you know, there's a, there's a, a void there for Pontiac. Um, so he started to hit the Pontiac dealerships, you know, going up in their attics, down in their basements, even out in their dumpsters. He was dumpster diving for NOS parts. When he could beat the, uh, the trash truck there, he was coming out with some good stuff. Because back then, those parts were just taking up space and uh, they, they really had no value to those dealerships. So we started buying the Pontiac parts and um, taking them to Carlisle, to you know, certain uh, McCunchy, and I think there was a series of, uh, actually, uh, I have a list of the swap meets that he was doing. Um, I don't know if you guys can see that too well. Sorry about that. Anyway, so he started selling all the, the NOS Pontiac parts, and then he saw that um, the NOS stuff was drying up certain pieces, and then he started to look into doing reproduction parts. This right here is the first themes catalog. This is 1982. It's a uh, four-page catalog. I wish you guys could see it better. I'm sorry about the, the image. Um, see, that's uh, four pages. And it's funny because you go through this, you go through this catalog, and you'll see this probably maybe a quarter of it, one page of reproduction, and the rest is stuff that is still available through uh, GM. Um, in fact, if you look here, I was looking at this last night, and I was like, "Wow, I wish I had money back then." I like the prices. A pair of '67 GTO mesh grills from GM, thirty-six dollars for the pair. Parking lot assemblies, $75 for complete assemblies. And even back then with the first catalog, if you um, look closely here, we started critiquing the product like we do now. And it, it started back then and we continue it to this day. Um, you know, boot material is die cut and stitched like original, vinyl is correct. Uh, just quality notes like that. that um, and I think that's one way we've stayed uh, above our competition because they do not do that. Uh, in some cases, I, I think you guys have probably seen notes in our catalogs where we said, use only as a last resort. I mean, what company does that? Basically tells the customer, don't buy this. You know, it's, uh, we, we want the repeat business. We're not looking for that, that one sale. We're looking for a long-term relationship with everyone that's, uh, that's a customer of ours. And we want to be there for them, uh, whether it's through tech or uh, uh, product, product knowledge, just all of that. So um, we always uh, looked at being, uh, you know, be honest, straightforward up front, and uh, tell the customer how it is, and let them make a good, educated decision on whether they wanted the piece or not. So this is 1982. So he started reproducing items, and this is about when he started coming over and testing the product on my cars, um, and then it just grew from there. Uh, up through the years, uh, the catalog kept growing, the number of uh, personnel kept growing, and uh, now our catalog is 320, I think 320 pages. We have over 50,000 uh, 50, parts. Um, 
it's just grown immensely. And we're not just stuck with the restoration side of it, we do some performance, and then also some uh, just uh, apparel and stuff like that, some of the, the so-called graphic stuff. This is a picture of uh, Steve at the uh, swap meets. See, it's five o'clock somewhere. That was uh, that was just the way. It, um, it's funny too because that truck in the background—that's where Steve would sleep. He wouldn't get a hotel room and sleep in the truck. And actually, to this day, he still sleeps in the truck mm -hmm. out behind our spaces. You'll mm -hmm. still. We, hey, Steve, pull it behind a you know a Carlisle. So he pulls in there with his truck and sleeps in it. So I guess with some old habits are hard to break, right? This is a uh, funny picture. So all the trucks that Steve has, he's never sold one of his company trucks except for this one. This one was the first one. Um, it's funny. It's uh, he had well, it says right there, three hundred fifty thousand miles on it. Uh, ran on uh, gas or propane. He had that big propane tank in the back, 114 gallons. Uh, constantly fixing it on the road. Um, he, to this day, he really uh, he kicks himself in the butt for ever getting rid of it because that was basically the truck that built the company. So he digitally, uh, he had one of his guys digitally image him with an old picture of that truck. That's how much he liked it. <laughs> This is kind of, uh, well, this is one of our early catalogs. This was probably, this dates back into the mid, mid to late 80s. Um, you know, the quality and service, the Ames customer service, they're evident with Steve holding the towel. I think, um, so Steve never dresses up. Never, ever. You will never, ever see him dressed up. Always wears holy jeans, just, just uh, you, you wander sometimes. So in this picture here, he's got a tuxedo top and he's wearing ratty old shorts for the picture. In fact, I got another picture somewhere and I couldn't find it of him with the shorts on and his tuxedo top. That's the, this is the only time you'll ever see him with a tie on, I can guarantee you that. This is another, uh, this was, I think this was the same catalog cover. This is catalog 5A, so this was uh, five catalogs into it, which uh, typically we did one a year. Um, this was one of our one of our first ones. I think it was yeah. I think it was the fifth catalog. And that catalog had probably maybe uh, forty pages. So it kind of tells you that you know as we kept as years kept going on, the product line kept getting bigger and bigger. And I'm sure you guys have all seen this guy. That's Harry. That's a mascot that we picked up in. Um, I think it was. Uh, Late 80s, early 90s. When I went to work with the company in '93, this was uh, uh, this was in a lot of the catalogs and a lot of our advertising. And it's funny, a lot of people um, say, "Well, why, why the eight? You know, what's the uh, symbol there?" Well, APE, Ames Performance Engineering. So sometimes we gotta just spell it out for them, but that's. Uh, we we kept them as a, a mascot. In fact, we, I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen the 30 foot tall purple ape at Norwalk and at some of the other shows, GTO Nationals and stuff. So I think uh, so. Basically, uh, well, I'm going to continue on through the uh, uh, the years here. Um, we uh, kept continuing to keep growing. 93, I went on to work for Steve. We kept growing the business, kept bringing a new product and everything. Um, we had some really, really good guys driving out. Uh, you know, we had uh, Terry, we had Wall, uh, myself, um, and a couple others that were real aggressive with bringing a new product and going after just everything and anything to try to make it so it's a one-stop shop, you know, where you guys don't have to go down, go to this company to buy this or that. You know, just come to Ames and we try to try to cover it all. Um, 
So throughout the years, uh, we kept growing. As, as I said, the catalogs now 300, about 325 pages, 50,000 plus products. Uh, we have a warehouse that's uh, pretty much uh, busting at the seams that we just built. Now we have to add on to it. Um, uh, so it's just uh, through the years, the growth and all that. And again, then it went to that point where Steve and Joan were ready to uh, ready to sell off the retail, and that's when Don and I stepped up to the plate. Uh, Steve and Joan still have the, uh, the wholesale division, which is uh, Ames uh, Automotive Engineering. We're actually their biggest customer. We buy the most product from them, them out of uh, all of their customers. And we're also into the manufacturing ourselves. We're starting to do more and more manufacturing. Um, on the manufacturing end, it's uh, a lot of it now is um, we're trying to refine the product line that's out there. Uh, is stuff that was out there made uh, years ago that wasn't 100% correct, didn't have the correct markings, didn't quite fit right, and we're, uh, we're trying to go through and, uh, and, and make that a better line. You know, uh, and simple things, little bumpers with the correct markings. Uh, you know, uh, it's just uh, a lot of stuff there that we're, we're working on, a lot, of, a lot of new products. We're doing a lot of cast iron uh, right now. We did uh, that uh, 1969 water pump. It's the four inch hub that's been discontinued. We just reproduced that. Um, we did uh, the exhaust manifold, 64 to 68, the stock factory prep exhaust manifold with the valve. Just a myriad of, uh, of product that we're working on. Um, and again, it's uh, trying, trying to fix some of the product out there that's not correct. And I'm sure you guys are all familiar with at one point you've had to deal with modifying something or possibly giving us a call and saying this doesn't fit or this doesn't work. You know, we're really trying to, uh, trying to better that. And I, I think we've come up with some good manufacturers out there. Uh, and when we, when we manufacture something, we don't just sell. Uh, a lot of people back, uh, I know companies that would just get a, they would send a piece off, it would come back, yep, looks good, run it. They'd never test it, never really critique it. And it's, uh, that's where you get the inferior parts. And um, we may go back and forth five, six times before we approve a piece. And we're not going to accept it until it's, until it's correct and what you know, meets our standards. But we always test it, always test it. We get a sample in, we're going to try it on a car. We may try it on two cars, you know, just, uh, and uh, we have usually uh, not just one guy doing it, but maybe there's a couple guys so we can get, you know, get a, bounce back some, uh, you know, get some input from uh, multiple, multiple people, so. <coughs> Anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I, bought, uh, I have a 67 GTL, I've been mean, raising 100 on that car. And over the years, <coughs> I have bought quite a few parts from you know, I mean, beautiful parts. Mm -hmm. But as you just mentioned, some of the parts that I've got are best for the fit. Uh, I will switch. Okay? And with the help, but it can come yeah. up. But if nothing goes on there, you know, the, uh, the part that comes down to that metal is not as long as the original. So it would really difficult to get that metal on there. Top, uh, convertible top is convertible. Convertible top, the two plates, that go on the top, that the uh, top uh, clips onto. Yep. Uh, I bought two, the two because the other were pretty well fitted. <coughs> and uh, the one is three, three screws on the back, and uh, the one just wasn't fit at all. And the screw in there. Uh, cigarette lighter. I ordered a new one. I had to use it. I had to smoke it. And uh, the catalog said this is the correct one. Well, it's not the correct one, but it's 67. Um, <coughs> also, I have a 64 GPO, not the original owner of that. And I had trouble with that the carburetor, the top plate, uh, the holes were not drilled in the, the, the correct position. So uh, the guy that helped me out get the gaskets or whatever. But anyway, I'm saying some of the parts. Well, that's one of the hurdles. If I, if I, if I want some 
small high and I don't pay uh, quite a bit for that shit. You do, and uh, on the other end of it, if you put a thousand or fifteen dollars, hundred dollar order together, you make out on that. It's uh, you know, shipping is one of the hurdles that we're trying to uh, get over. As you know, UPS is just uh, they're out of control. I mean, it, and I say they're out of control. It's just their rates keep going up. The fuel surcharges, they never drop the fuel surcharges. When we had four dollar fifty, uh, you know, dollar a gallon, four dollars and fifty cent prices for a gallon of diesel, they raised the surcharge, and well, now it's down to two dollars and thirty cents. The surcharge never went down. So it's just uh, unfortunately, it's um, the, the cost is uh, it's it's it's, it's uh, very. Uh, very tough on us, um, and we try to keep our shipping as fair as possible. At the same time, you know, we need to cover the cost. Um, we're working with USPS now, which uh, I'll tell you they're doing real well. Um, we ship out probably uh, maybe 500 packages a day on a good day, and right now between the two, USPS and UPS, it's split in half. We have a system that we can, uh, when we log in the package, it'll get the rates, and if we go with, uh, you know, we're going to go with the, 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 the best rate, a lot of it's going over at USPS. So and that's all pretty new to us, and um, we, we really need to get a good 12 months under our belt before we can really start looking at the catalog and passing over that savings to the customers. You know, it, it seems too good to be true right now, so uh, we don't want to, you know, it's, uh, we don't want to jump the gun yet, so. Kind of thing, what I understand, the parts close on the cottage, okay, but you're doing a remodel, I guess, of the night. Yes, yep. I'm sure that costs a lot. It, it does, it does. There's, there's a big cost there. And uh, the good thing is, uh, nowadays it's all reverse engineering. It's not, um, uh, we, we don't have to do the blueprints and all that. It's basically taking a, an original piece. And one thing we do is we never, well, one thing we don't do is ever reproduce from a reproduction. You know, that's the worst thing anyone could do. So we, we take, uh, you know, we find the original parts, uh, good quality original pieces, and we'll, uh, we'll send them out to quote. Um, and usually we'll send it out to, uh, depending on the piece, uh, we could send it out to three different manufacturers and take the best quote of the three as long as we know um, any of the manufacturers we use are all quality, good quality, uh, you know, uh, companies that do, do very nice work. Overall, the Well, good. And, you know, if any of you guys, uh, like we tell anyone, if they have a problem with something, call us and, and we'll work through it. If it's one of our own pieces, we can change, uh, we will make the changes. It's a little more difficult when it's someone else's piece that you're buying from them and they're sitting on 500 pieces in a container, a lot of times they're just going to say, well, we got to sell these out first. And, and unfortunately, then our hands are tied, and that's when we pass on to the customers, whether through the catalog or through the system, that uh, this piece is, uh, you know, uh, there's quality issues with it. This, is, this needs to be done, or uh, uh, like you are saying, the screw holes are in the wrong location, need to be modified. So we try to educate the customer and then let them make the decision of if they want to order it or not. And if that's the only reproduction out there, well, other than trying to find a, a good use original or possibly having your original piece uh, re, uh, remand, you know, that's um, you gotta you gotta deal with the, the problems. But again, we we uh, we're, we're working more on more manufacturing to try to find those pieces out there that are uh, that other people are making that are inferior. Do them ourselves. Of course, at that point, we need to have the volume too. So, um, you know, we can't. Uh, it doesn't make sense uh, economically to reproduce something that you're only selling maybe ten a year when you have to buy a thousand pieces. So we have to make some good, uh, educated decisions on which pieces we're going to do, and um, yeah, that's part of the part of the process. Yes. Uh, is there any chance that somebody will start making the the tail light, the chrome tail light bezels, and the 65 uh, Le Mans and GTOs, and these go across the back, it says Lion, you know, they're made out of pop metal? Uh, we have the die-cast bezels. We do have the bezels. Yeah, but that center panel, at this point, um, we went back and forth with the manufacturer, and, and the, the problem there is such a long 
such a large die cast piece. It's 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 tough. When I heard somebody was going to talk about making a lot of plastic, is, is that is that being pursued? Yeah, that never uh, that never came to be. Because somebody makes them. The vessels and plastic. Yeah. 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 Really good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's something. Uh, you know, we may revisit that. Uh, you know, we sent uh, we sent some panels off to get quoted, and it was basically came back with, "Hey, that's too big of a piece for us." And I think it was uh, they they couldn't guarantee the quality of the piece either. You know, it's just uh, it was such a uh, an intricate. Uh, piece and it's so large. So I got two of them all fitted up. Oh yeah, and you know to get those recurrent, um, it's tough. It's tough to find someone that will do a good job because you gotta, you actually gotta get anything grind out the pits, and then you have the divots, and you gotta fill the divots, and then you can't have shrinkage because otherwise, you know, depending on how much they fill it and prep it, you could rechrome it, and then you'll see all the divots. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing that reproduced in, uh, we just came out with the 64 5 full quarter panels. Those are available now for the GTO Le Mans. Which oh, those are just the, the outside piece? Before it was just the skin. Yeah. And those were. All the way to the sail panel? Yeah, all the way, all the way to all the spot belts. In the door jam, up the sail panel. Right there. I'm sorry? What's the quality like right there? Uh, they just hit the floor today, back at, uh, back at the shop. Um, we have sold a couple pairs um, based on the quality that we heard from the manufacturer, you know, talking to them. Uh, we'll check them. In fact, they were checking them this afternoon back at, uh, back at the shop, and uh, we'll know more here uh, when we get back. But uh, so far, so good. Same manufacturer as the 60 or 67 front Uh Yes. Yep. Uh, those are pretty decent. I think there's some long game to the holes that need to be done. Um, you know, there's some... Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately with a lot of this, uh, the sheet metal, you know, there is scraping that needs to be done. It's well, just... Uh, yeah. You should know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we want to know. We need to know if there's, there's uh, issues. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We just went back to the manufacturer on those. Uh, what happened there is, um, and this is what you get as a manufacturer, you really have to keep on on top of your uh, uh, when you do a new run. You really need to check each new run when you come in, because um, what happens is it may get outsourced to another another manufacturer, and you just you don't know. You you prove the first run. And you know you run another thousand pieces, and you really need to get a sample of each each run to, to make sure that you don't get stuck like that. And that's that doesn't happen often. Usually, it's, it's the product is ran by the, through the same tooling and the same manufacturer that did the first run. But every now and then, they'll switch manufacturers, and then it's it's a it's a really uh, could be a uh, shot in the dark, let's say, on the quality. Yep. Yep. And then, uh, you know, and, and we definitely want to hear if there's problems, uh, you know, and then we can just, uh, we can note it or go after them and, and try to correct them. Can I jump in that one? Yeah. What is your primary mechanism for that feedback? Oh, uh, our salespeople, I'm going to say. They don't seem to be that interesting. <laughs> well, they should be. Unfortunately, salespeople, you know, they'll, depending on who you get, if you talk to a tech, you know, uh, the salespeople are pretty much going from call to call to call. And uh, they're supposed to be passing on that information to the right person, whether it be uh, one of the techs or one of the, uh, the, the higher ups, so we can, uh, we can go after a manufacturer or a vendor and, and correct the problems. But you don't have a product review mechanism on your website, do you? Uh, we do not, no. Is there a reason why you don't do that? Oh, it's just not the way the website was ever set up. You know, I mean, we do take, um, one thing we, uh, we have the, uh, the forum, the PY forum, and that's, um, that's actually, uh, you know, the problem here is you get everyone's opinion, and you may have one person that 
shoot, uh, you know, action pause reaction. You try to fit something on there, we'll sit back and wonder why it doesn't fit. And not just uh, say it's junk, you know, and that's the problem. You have some people that just will immediately say it's junk and then they'll start just, uh, they'll start a thread and it's just, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be done constructively. I guess that's what I'm, what I'm, I'm thinking and uh, what I'm saying. One of the values of Product review mechanism on the web like that is you know, when I look, when I look at reviews, you see you know, five stars, you see one star, and you just read the reviews for all, and you kind of pick through it and say, you know, the majority of our five stars, you get one one star, and then you just get the guy that just didn't fit right away and gave up and criticized it, and you just dismiss that. I mean, and everybody else rated it as five, so you can get a feel of that product that it was, it was a good quality. So I, I find that the product, those sources that have product reviews very helpful. Sure, it depends on the number of reviews. If you have two reviews on a piece, you know, one says it's junk, the other person says it's good, it's 50-50. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's, I think if, with reviews, you need a, a lot of reviews, and you need, um, uh, also need to take it with a grain of salt. There needs to be a mechanism to do that. Sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, just along those same lines, you do provide something. I just took advantage of it not too long ago. Um, uh, I notice when I place an order, you acknowledge the order, I get an email, and, it, and somewhere in that string of emails that I get, you invite feedback of any, of any problems, and you can just click right on that link. So yeah. I took advantage of that uh, just not too long ago, because overall, I already stole a whole car, not a GTO, sorry. <laughs> but, um, but uh, and most of the parts came from you, thank you very much. So all in all, really good. I had a few bad things, and I, wrote up something along those lines, just yep. simply stating all of that. And I did have a couple of specific issues that I never took up with you guys, and but I'm providing it back as feedback. I just, so to this sure. point, I just wanted to say you do provide that opportunity to get feedback in. But I also was kind of wondering whether or not that information goes anywhere because I didn't get like an acknowledgement. Not necessarily that I expected one, but um, just kind of want to be assured from you that that gets out and goes somewhere once it Sure. If you we do have the customer service uh, email address on our website and also on those uh, confirmations um, where you can go through the customer service end of it. And we try to, uh, we really do try to address everything. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if it's not being addressed and someone's not doing the job, then I'm going to be talking with them. You know, it's, um, uh, I think, um, back to the, to the, the feedback, um, you know, I guess uh, we like to make our own decisions as far as we're, uh, we have probably a handful of uh, real good people there that have worked on cars and we have tons of cars to, to uh, test it. Uh, we have quite a collection ourselves. So when we hear something like that, we like to do the legwork ourselves and uh, really uh, and throw it around. Hey, what do you guys think of this bit? We'll take pictures of it and, we'll, and if, it, if it is a, a definite issue, uh, because unfortunately, sometimes it's not such a big issue, and it's it's blown out of proportion. So it's, and I'm not saying that happens a lot, but we, you know, it it, it does happen, you know, and it's uh, you know, you like to like to address them all, but sometimes it's um, it's uh, I think some people expect it to be better than what it is, and it's very acceptable piece, you know. It's uh, I'll tell you, GM was never perfect, you know. I will I could have brought in I did a. Uh, I spoke at one of the, the meets and, I, and it was on uh, quality control and all that and reproduction versus original. And I had a series of uh, original GM pieces and I laid them out and then I had a series of reproductions. And I, uh, I had someone come up and I said, pick out the, the reproduction pieces. You know, to, and they were picking GM. Uh, probably, I think five times out of five out of eight, they picked GM. And the quality of those GM pieces were very questionable. And some of them were emblems. Uh, parking light lenses. You got to figure these cars were built. These were production built cars, production line built cars. They were cranking out thousands and thousands of these cars. They weren't looking at bringing it to the GTOA or bringing it to these shows to to have a uh, judge concourse. What we've done, we've over restored these cars. Really, it's uh, it's something that's happened, and it's uh, to go back and actually tell someone, no, your paint should have orange peel in it. Or no, that door gap should be this thick there, you know, uh, and down there, you know, should be more than a more than a quarter inch or a, a five sixteenths. 
you know, it's just uh, we've lost sight of what these cars were originally, how they were built originally. And we have several low mileage cars that we use for R and D. I mean, cars with under ten thousand miles on them, and you can't argue with the way that that car is set. It's never been changed. Nothing's uh, nothing's been replaced. It hasn't been restored. So we always got to keep that in mind too. But and not to not to say that uh, you know we're, we're going to sacrifice quality because of uh, the way these cars were built, kind of not at that uh, concourse type level, but you just got to always keep that in mind. Yes? I'm glad I walked in and met you and heard the story a little bit because uh, the last couple of years I was just looking here, uh, my production car was $3,100 then and I spent on $20,000 with you guys. <laughs> so, who's the fool in the room? <laughs> uh, so, hey, hey, we all are. <laughs> we all are anyway, anyway, so I want to pay a compliment on the, the service that your people do provide on the phone. Uh, but to touch, not to be negative, but to touch on what a couple of gentlemen said. And, and I heard what you said earlier about we like to present our customers with, you know, give them the best description and then let them make the choice. Yeah. Well, at one, excuse me, one point, uh, you know, I pulled a headliner out of the car and I don't know a headliner from the floor, man, you know, and, until I pull it out and uh, then I'm back and forth with them on the phone, you know, five bow, six bow, you know, uh, four and a half bow, whatever. And we're talking on the phone and we're talking to technical people and, you know, I'm, an absolute, you know, this bow exactly right here, this one exactly right here. Well, they made the choice on which, well, they told me which one I had. Shipped it, uh, went, to the, went to a guy to try to put it in, uh, didn't work out, had the wrong one. The old head there came in and said, no, they sent you the wrong one, that's not the one. You don't count that little thing there, that's not a bow. Things happen. Um, so, I called back and talked to the gal there, and you know, I was cordial and polite, and I was in a sense of getting personal about it. Things happen, but I said, Well, you know, at this point, I'd like to speak to somebody in customer service if I could. And she said, Well, you pretty much are. And I said, Well, you know, it's, I, I'm not happy with this, and spent quite a bit of money on it, and you know, it, so basically, the ball was dropped there. So, as a customer, what do you think I did? Start shopping elsewhere. Sure. And it wasn't happy about it at all. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. No, that's okay. Yeah. I mean, things happen. I understand. Yeah. But I'm glad that I talked, heard you tell your story and, and all that and make it a little bit more personal. I didn't give up on names and I'm back with them and I'm, because of the products. And yeah. people do do a great job. But I think uh, I did hear you speaking this morning to somebody that said, well, I'm going to talk to that person or something. So just always remember that, you know, we are individuals that are investing a lot of money in these, and, and I, your profit margin probably aren't that great on what you're selling. You know, it's a business for you too, and you gotta, you gotta stay above board. But uh, it, it does get personal when someone calls in and then tries to talk to someone, and you know, it's just, I say, they're talking about some research, so we pretty much are. And I used to speak to someone else, she said, well, that's not possible. And that's where it was left, and I didn't, didn't let me do a good thing, so. But I, again, like you said, we appreciate your products. Yeah, well, that's not our standard way of operating either. And, uh, you know, it's uh, we have uh, meetings with our salespeople all the time. I mean, uh, what keeps paychecks going into their bank account is you guys, the customers. And uh, customers that are every, you know, in customer service, and we deal with them, uh, the, you know, the follow up. And follow up is, is key too. You know, if you tell someone you're going to do something, that are being wanted. And we talk to them, you know, that we always have these talks where they call it pep talk or just uh, that's that's the way we operate and that's quite how we expect it, uh, expect our salespeople to be. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, every now and then we have a situation like that. And, you know, I, I really, I'm, I've got an open door. I want problems to come up to me like that so I can, I can resolve them and have a uh, and continue doing business with uh, the customer and just make them feel that we took care of it and we didn't just blow them off. 
It's not just that we're not just concerned about the order or the money, it's the relationship. Yeah, even if it didn't work out that day, I would have felt better being able to speak to someone at the next pay grade. Yes. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, again, I, I apologize for that deal. Yeah. And, uh, uh, that, was, that was probably $12,000 for the parts ago. I'm over. All right. Well, <laughs> yeah. well, you know me, so if you have a problem again, I would expect that any of you to yeah, okay. ask for me. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm there. <coughs> We'll get addressed, I can guarantee you that. I probably get two or three emails a week from the original parts group, you know. Yep. Have sales. And oh, yeah. I'm going to deal uh, and buy $199 worth of parts. It's free shipping and stuff yep. like that. But I've not seen any emails from Ames promoting anything like that. We don't operate that way. <laughs> I will tell you, most of those emails you get are smoke and mirrors. If you do the, what I always tell a customer is, or we will take, if a customer calls in, say, I have this order from OPG and they're going to do this for me, okay, can you please fax it to me and email it to me, and we'll go down through and do a price comparison. We do it all the time, and I will tell you, we come out on top all the time on these orders. Okay, so and we don't offer all this, uh, the, the, the big promotional uh, sales, sales, sales. Uh, so we pretty much keep it at our catalog pricing. We have volume discounts, uh, which are set at five hundred and a thousand dollars, and it's uh, we try to stay as fair as possible with that pricing and our freight. And, uh, and again, we, we beat the competitors out nine times out of ten. Okay, well I, I have bought it. But yeah. I see them all the time. Oh yeah, I, I get them too. I'm subscribed to them because I like to see what the competition's yeah, doing. So I'm always seeing these, and then I'll, I'll send, you know, I'll do, oh, hey, let me do a little price price comparison. We're probably 8%. Awesome. By the time they get done with their free freight, they're 10% off and everything, we're still about 8 to 10% less than them. Okay, good. Yeah. Because I got a lot of stuff I have to buy. Yeah. And, you know, it, all I ask is if the customer does, do their due diligence. If you, I'm you just know, not getting to put the thing back together. It's, uh, we, I just had a, uh, one of my salespeople came to me and said, uh, uh, this customer wants us to, to give him free freight because OPG's got him. And uh, I said, okay, did you get the order from him? Uh, yes, I got it right here. They're all the, uh, the parts that they were ordered and the total price from, uh, from those guys. And I said, okay, well, you go through our catalog and do, a, do an estimate, bring it all up and see where we fall. And, even with that freight, this was about a $1,200 order, we were still $150 less than them. And this was with freight, where they were offering supposedly free freight. When anyone says free, then nothing's free. It's, they're, they're making up for it somewhere. You know, it's, it's worked into the price of something. You know, so. It's, uh, yeah, again, I see all those flyers, those emails coming through, mass mails. You know, it's just, um, I'll go back to saying the smoke and mirrors most of the time. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, in the, in the process of restoring my car over the last 12 years, I had to replace the body. Again. And uh, I noticed that the, in some cases, I've just been unable to find the original you know, body parts. Okay. So mm -hmm. I had to use some reproduction stuff. And on the one hand, the reproduction parts seem to be coming there. They have anti corrosive coatings on them and so on, which obviously the factory parts never did. Yep. But the one thing that I have noticed that was kind of negative about the body panels is, is the sheet metal seems to be quite a bit thinner than the, the original. Do, do, do you have a feel for that? Do you know? Do, do you have any idea how much thinner the, the, the body panels are? I think we came up with it. May have been a couple of thousands or so um, on a couple of the pieces. It depends on which pieces and which manufacturers. Okay. You know, we try to deal with the best ones out there. I, I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, AMD. Uh, they're actually uh, uh, two of the guys that uh, were with Goodwin are now with AMD, and they have they have probably some of the best best sheet metal. Of course, Goodwin was one of the best suppliers out there yeah. for sheet metal. Yeah. Uh, front fenders for sixty eight sixty. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, the, the, the ones that fit right, the mold lines are right on, and the ones that the mold lines are right on, fit right. 
Yeah, and those the 68.9 front fenders we tell our customers water, water only is the last resort because you're going to need, a, yeah, need well, to do a lot of work. They were my last resort. Yeah, yeah. I found a set of uh, you know of original a pair of original fenders at Frank's in California. You may be familiar with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, a little bit of surface rust. They're not straight. They need some work. What do you want for them? Twenty three hundred dollars for the pair. Okay, and the recaps are like four hundred dollars. Yeah. So based on that, you can afford to put some time and do some work. Sure. Yeah, and if you do a lot of the work yourself and stuff, that's uh, that definitely helps out. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I've got a 64 GTO. I'm not the original owner, but, but uh, a couple of years ago, I had to get a new starter for it. I ordered a starter for you all. And if I remember correctly, you send it back and you get a port charge, rate, or whatever, but the shipping charge will take you a little bit more. So, will you send it back? Yeah, yeah. I'll be honest, what we've done on those core charges, <coughs> if the uh, manufacturer is charging us a $10 core charge, we'll charge a $35 core charge. That way, you're going to send it back. And really, having cores is very important. Um, that's what makes a lot of these parts dry up, is the manufacturers, uh, the re-manufacturer people, they do not have cores. Because of that reason, you know, some people that a five dollar core charge, you're not going to send it back. Mm -hmm. But a thirty-five dollar core charge, depending on the weight of the piece, you're going to send it back. And of course, we're going to give you the thirty-five dollars back, no problem. And it's going to guarantee that we get a four back that we can send back to uh, whether it's a one Cardone or one of the other manufacturers, so we can continue to offer that car. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a shame to see those things get thrown in the trash. <coughs> yeah, but yeah. you know the freight's always based on weight, so. Yeah, like a starter. In a case like that, bring it to us at one of the shows. You know, if you okay. can, yeah. Yeah, we're more than happy to take product back, or cores back, or returns at the shows. Um, and also, you know how we, uh, with the shows, we do all our, a lot of pre-orders. So, you guys want anything brought to the show, give us a call ahead of time. We'll bring it to you, and it'll save you a lot of freight, depending on the piece. Of so, that's where the freight really is for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We don't share any fee. Yeah, that is free freight right there. True. If you get offer credit, well, yeah. purchase credit for course. What's that? Purchase credit for course that you need, just put it in the magazine. Yep. And people set it in. Oh, it. sure. Yep. You have a value yeah. for it. Well, that's what happened. You know what? That's what happened with the uh, that four inch hub uh, water pump. That's why we ended up reproducing it. People weren't sending back the ports. And it's such a, it's like a half a year, not even a half a year pump. No, but we all got garage, garage full of old, old parts. You know, I, do, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right there with you. <laughs> Any other questions? I just want to be clear on that last point because yes. I'm one of those guys too that has a bunch of cores laying around that I can't bring myself to throw out. So yep. I could just bring cores to the next show and hand them to you and you'd be happy to take yeah, them? Yeah, I mean if it's something... I'd be happy to give them to you. <laughs> well, and that's just it. And you know what's it's unfortunate? We've, um, with A1 Cardone, they want it back in a box, an A1 Cardone box. And we tried to say, hey, we got this whole tote full of cores. Why don't you guys we just want to take it? Why don't you take it just so you have cores? They won't take it back unless it's in an A1 Cardone box. Which, but other other main free manufacturers, uh, they're not like that. And that's, yeah, if it's something we can send back, I mean, I myself have a bunch of cores just like you guys sitting in my garage. And I just, I bring them in and I say, hey, guys, see if you can get these back to the, the re manufacturers. You know, I don't even care if I get any any money for them. It's just get them back and then we, we still have product for re -made. You know, it's, uh, that's important. Any other questions? All right, well, I hope I didn't bore you guys too much. Great to see you. Enjoy the show and uh, thank you for uh, thank you for coming in.